On the next episode of Painting and Travel, Sarah meets a Florida living history expert who describes the history and food of Fort Mose in St. Augustine, Florida, while Roger paints with oils to recreate a moment in time. Welcome to a very special outdoor kitchen. This is where the blending of several cultures takes place, and we'll learn about that a bit later. First, I want to find out what Roger's going to paint, and I think he started sketching. Things are moving pretty fast, but I always love to get out here and do a couple sketches real quick. And this is Emma. I know, I know she doesn't want to stay bent over like that very long, so I'm just doing this very quick. Then I'll take a reference photograph, and uh, maybe we'll do a painting of this back in the studio. I really like this scene, stirring that pot there. And uh, often my sketches really don't uh, come into much play when I'm working on a finished painting. They just don't have that much information on them. But I just like to get out here and, uh, and do sketches like this. It's just simply, it's simply a fun thing to do. But it just helps keep me in practice with, uh, with drawing and everything. It keeps me a little bit familiar with the subject. The main thing is I just love to draw and observe. I can fill a sketchbook like this with uh, hundreds of sketches that only take just a minute or two. But when you look back in them, they, uh, they remind you of the subject much better than a, a photograph ever would, even though there's not a lot of detail in it. Well, I guess that'll about finish that sketch. It's making me hungry. <laughs> now that I'm back in the studio, I've decided to use this view of Emma cooking which is slightly different from the view that I sketched out in the field. I'm using a 16 by 20 inch board of masonite and it's covered with some linen canvas and I'm using oil paints today. Now I've already sketched her out on this board here. I usually start with my darks but in this case I think I'm going to start right here with her dress. Now I'm going to keep this rather thin because I don't want to lose all my lines here that I've drawn in. So I'll keep this very, very thin to begin with, just to get my values going. So this is almost like working with a watercolor right now. Just blocking this in quickly. And right over here on her sleeve, that's in shadow as well. Let's go up here to her face. I think I'll take some uh, yellow ochre and uh, maybe a little blue, touch of burnt sienna. And again, I'll just put this on rather thin, maybe slightly darker down under her chin. I'm not too concerned about the colors right now. It's mainly these, these values. That's, when I say values, I just mean that the light, lights and darks. We have her hand down here, stirring this pot. Right down here is her left hand, and part of that's in shadow and part of it's not. This kind of sets the tone for the whole painting and also for the background. When I look at this now, I can maybe judge a little more whether I, I want the background to be a lot darker or lighter. I'll keep going here for now. Right back here is her skirt. 
don't want that a pure cerulean blue, but I'm mixing cerulean blue and a bit of burnt sienna to warm that up. This is quite dark, but I will add a touch of white to that. Now my reference photo is sitting over here on my laptop computer quite close to me, so I can look over there and uh, use that as reference. All right, let's continue with the dress here, and I'll add some yellow ochre to that just a touch with my titanium white. And I'll go up here and put a little of that warm color on her headscarf. Now the photograph I'm using does not have the pot down here. She was actually working on some other food preparation at the time. So I've used another reference photo to uh, sketch in this pot. And it's quite dark. It's very dark. I'm going to just keep continuing with this right down here. There's some other cloth of her dress or something down there. I like that. It sort of ties everything to a with a dark color to the base of this painting. This is her shoe, part of her shoe here. I don't have a very large palette space on here, so I'm going to wipe off some of this paint. I'm just gonna jump up here and cut around their back with this dark color. Right now, I just wanna keep this dark. I can add a few other colors along the way. Put in some burnt sienna in some of this. Keep some of it warm, some of it cool. But mainly I just want to keep that very, very dark up there for the time being. This was part of the uh, cooking hut back here. Now I think I'll gray some of these other areas. So I'll mix some of my white burnt umber and some blue. I don't want this whole background to be dark throughout the painting. I want to get some variations in here. And I want to be sure I use enough paint on this. Right here, this part of the painting does not need to be thin. I can really lay this on because I don't have any pencil lines to lose because there's nothing worse than an oil painting with very, very thin paint on it. it. Just looks very weak if the paint is too thin. It's very difficult to keep a painting loose because the urge is to go in and put detail everywhere. But just like a photograph, a nice photograph is often has soft focus. It's out of focus in the background. And then you get your sharp focus where the subject is. So that's what I'll try and do here. Keep this as a soft focus back here. We have some nice shadows on the ground. So I'll try and remember those. Keep these in here. I'm going to cut in right by her arm here and skirt. Oh, this might be nice right here. These two values, I'm sure I'll change them as I go along, but these two values are sort of the same. So I'll be getting kind of a lost edge there, which I think might be nice. It's often nice not to have to define every single part of the painting. Losing some edges here and there often make a painting much more interesting. All right, with my yellow ochre, once again, we'll put some of these lighter patches of sunlight on the ground here. Oh, I really have to wash out my brush because I'm picking up that blue and it's mixing with the yellow ochre. So it's, I'm not getting that clean, warm color. That's one disadvantage of oils is the, uh, stay wet so long that they mix with other colors on the palette and often you can uh, get a very muddy color or unwanted color because they do mix. So sometimes you have to uh, just wait a day or so and let things dry and then begin again. The alternative to that is just to lay the paint on very thick and that way it won't mix quite as much. All right, let's wipe this off again. and go back up to this back side here and put some more of these dark colors in. I have a number of greens on my palette today. I've got uh, sap green, phthalo green. I've got a chromium oxide green. Generally, I like to mix my own greens, but uh, it really depends sort of day by day what I like to put out on my palette. I do want to make this 
darker right down here because there is some nice steam flowing up from this pot. And if I make this dark right now, uh, it will give me some uh, leeway in there to go over that later and create that look of steam. So this entire interior of this pot is just sort of boiling up with steam. I can just see the edges of the pot a little bit. All right, let's put this painting aside for a few minutes and head back out to Fort Mose to join Sarah and we'll learn a bit more about this fascinating and historic site. Hi, welcome to St. Augustine. This is Andrew Batten and he's an historical interpreter from Florida Living History. And we're standing here at Fort Mose. It's an important part of American history that I missed when I read my history books. Maybe you can tell us about it. Well, it's a fascinating piece of history. Fort Mose was founded in 1738. It is the first settlement of free black Americans in what became the United States of America. And so if you could escape from the slave states to our north and get here to Spanish Florida, you could earn your freedom. I see. And that must have been very complicated. Was there an underground railroad system? Well, not as you had later on. It was really on your own initiative. You had to make your way south from the Carolinas uh, through Georgia and then here to Spanish Florida. And once you did, as long as you agreed to the requirements for citizenship, you could earn your freedom and live here at Fort Mose. There's much of American history that I remember, and I do remember hearing about underground railroads, but what happened here was 150 years before what I remember reading about. Exactly. You think of the Underground Railroad going north, you yes. know, escaping to Canada. Here, the first Underground Railroad ran south. And Spain gave this piece of property for the sole purpose of having a place for the um, escape, the freed slaves to live? Exactly. Now, it's very interesting. The Spanish were very pragmatic people. This is a frontier settlement, and so they're going to ask certain things of you in return. One of them is you're going to convert to the Catholic Church. The second is you're going to provide militia service. So in other words, this was not just a settlement, this was a fortress. There was a fortification somewhere just off this way that would have guarded the approaches to St. Augustine. So the men who lived here at Fort Mose, in addition to farming, fishing, doing their other trades, they would have been providing military service to guard the approaches to St. Augustine. So you were immediately drafted. It was a difficult life. It began in 1738. Now, there had been people who had escaped to Spanish Florida as much as 50 years before that, but there wasn't a formal settlement like there was at Fort Mose. Established in 1738, the British came in 1740 and burned it to the ground. People came back and rebuilt it, and then it became a, a going concern again. British came back, and so it was a, an area constantly in conflict. Uh, this land was called the debatable land because Spain claimed it, England claimed it, and Fort Mose was sandwiched in between. Today is a special day because you're celebrating the autumn harvest. Exactly. A very important time in all the colonies. In the northern colonies, this is your last chance for anything good to eat. Not quite as severe here in Spanish Florida, but what you find here that you don't find elsewhere is this blending of cultures, which makes it so interesting. Not just in Fort Mose, but in all of Spanish Florida and throughout the Caribbean, you have a mixture of African food traditions, Spanish traditions, Native American, South American, Central American, all of these ingredients, all of these traditions blending together to create something completely new and different. So food fusion started right here, perhaps in St. Augustine. Exactly. The first fusion cuisine right here. And what are some of the items uh, and some of the people that would be fusing this? Well, ex essentially, we start on this side. These are the native ingredients. And so what were the things that the Spanish found when they came here? Some of them very familiar to us, some of them not. I see you're looking at the yaupon holly. That makes a tea out of the leaves, which was a very, very powerful, extremely high in caffeine. If you think Starbucks has got caffeine, it's nothing compared to this. So it's a drink that the natives used that became a local drink here in Florida. If you couldn't afford real tea or coffee, that'll get you going in the morning. Okay, I'll keep that in mind. <laughs> and then things like pumpkins and squash we're familiar with today things that came from the Native Americans, berries of different types, corn, of course. And then we get into the African part of it, 
a lot of things we think of as real all-American food, collard greens and black-eyed peas, that southern cooking, yams, all of those come from Africa. And so those are traditions that came in with the, the Africans who came here to Spanish Florida. So you have that merging into it. And then what the Spanish brought themselves, citrus fruit, garbanzo beans, figs, dates, all of those things, and of course pork. You couldn't have a feast in Spanish Florida without pork. Well, you know, Florida is known for citrus, but um, it was brought here. Exactly. All came over with the Spanish, and so they brought lemons, limes, oranges here. Interestingly enough, that's not the first crop that they produced commercially here. The first thing they produced in St. Augustine was onions, and so they shipped those back to the Caribbean and to Spain for money. I see. And I know they still grow a lot of onions here today. Exactly so. And so what you see on this table is you see a fusion of three different strains, three different peoples all coming together. And if you think about it today, if you go to a barbecue restaurant, that's real American cooking, but it isn't. It's combinations of ingredients from all over the world. So you have cornbread made with Native American corn, but next to collard greens, which are from Africa, and black-eyed peas, which are African. Then you take pork, barbecued pork, that's Spain's infusion, but they're cooking it like Native Americans. The word barbecue comes from barbacoa. That's the frame on which the Native Americans would grill their meat. And so it's Spanish food, but being cooked like a Native American. So if you go to a pig picking in North Carolina, um, that isn't something that they invented. No, it's not. You think about a good barbecue sauce. A good barbecue sauce always balances bitter and sweet. So it's vinegar mixed with brown sugar or it's molasses or something like that. So that's the Spanish infusion right there. They are taking something in their case, they would have taken bitter orange juice. They would have marinated the pork in it, roasted it, basted it, and then just before serving, they would have sprinkled a light crust of sugar on top. So every bite is a blending of bitter and sweet, just like the way they viewed the world. It makes it sound much more important than I realized to have the celebration of the harvest, uh, because of course you have to have food to live. Exactly. And everything that they've worked hard for all year long would be um, right here. It's true, and you learn so much about a people from their food. And this looks like it might have been made from a gourd. It is. It's a hollowed out gourd, and then it's filled with beeswax, and so we use that for storage. That's something that the natives would have used. Oh, it makes it kind of waterproof exactly. then, and the beeswax, no bacteria. Exactly. Oh, it's so clever, and it's so lightweight. Exactly so. If you're traveling, as they did, from winter grounds to summer grounds every year, you've got to travel light. Yes, yes. Well, so what's the hottest spice on the table here? Well, Spanish cuisine at this time was different from the rest of Europe. Everyone, you think of English cooking or German or French even at this time, it's not terribly exciting. Spanish were different because they had access to the spice markets of North Africa. Yes. And so you find things like hot peppers that no one else in Europe would have been using in the middle of the 18th century, but the Spanish loved them. And then of course they came over here and found even hotter peppers in Central and South America. Andrew, I've enjoyed learning from you. Thanks very much. Well, thank you. And we'll check in with Roger now and see how his painting's coming along. Well, I'm going to stay with this larger brush for a little while longer, and I'll begin to work on these areas up here. I can start putting on much thicker paint right now. And putting on thick paint is really quite important on a, an oil painting, especially in the areas that are light. On the darker areas, you the uh, paint does not have to be as thick, but to give it some, the look of some body, some substance, these lighter areas really need to be put on with a thicker amount of paint. Right down here, her apron is catching a lot of light. So I'm just picking up my titanium white and laying it on there and it's mixing with some of this color underneath. So it's not pure white, but close. On this sleeve here, it's catching some very pretty light. I hope you can see how this thick paint helps to capture the light. Now I'm putting these strokes on here and I'm trying to just leave them alone. I don't want to blend them. If I were to blend them, I would lose that nice rich texture that I've applied there. I'm going to put down my larger brush and pick up a smaller brush and, and work on the face. I have some purple, some yellow ochre, and that might be my flesh tone. And here I'm applying this thicker as well. Now let's take that purple and yellow ochre. Let me get my ruler here, steady my hand. 
I'm just putting some highlight right on her nose here and right above her eye. It's not too much detail in this face. Now let me move up to this scarf on her head. And I want to lose some of this scarf in the background. So I'll just take some of this color from right in here. And I'll just drag that right into the scarf area. Just create a nice soft edge there. All that blue color is coming from the, the uh, influence of the sky. That's where that blue comes from. And I'll take some black, mix it in with that. And we'll put a few small accents right back here where this bun is in the back. All right, I'll move down to this sleeve right here and I'll do the same thing. I'll take some of this background color and just bring it right into the sleeve. We want to kind of lose that edge there. All right, let's move right over here to this other sleeve. And it tends to be darker in this shadowy area. So I'll still use primarily my cerulean blue Mix it with a bit of warm burnt umber. And right in here we've got some folds and wrinkles. Now I don't want to overdo these areas here, these wrinkles, but I want to put enough in there to give it a nice look. I think I'll make this darker right down here under her arm. Now I'll pick up some of this green from the background and I'll soften this edge back here. Just drag that in slightly. Kind of scumble that around. Same with her dress. Sort of lose that edge back there. Just want to make that disappear. It's very dark right down here between her fingers and her thumb. And actually in the photograph she was turning over a piece of meat on a uh, skillet. but. Uh, since I've put this pot here, I'm going to put in her hand a little stirring stick. So we'll run that right down there into the pot. Well, let's deal with this pot some more. I'm going to mix a warm color again and define the edge of this pot a little better than I have. It goes around there and it comes back. I want to get that good feeling of an oval there coming around the back side to the front. And right down below here, there are a number of coals that are burning. I'm going to put in some darker areas first with some burnt umber and some black. So just a lot of sort of rough brush strokes down in here. Maybe put an indication of a few sticks or things down in here. Now there's some beautiful embers burning down here with they're very orange. So I'll take my yellow and red, touch a white, and with some thick paint, I'll just touch that in here and not blend it at all. Just touch the brush there and leave those strokes. I don't see it in my photograph, but I'm going to take some of this orange and put a slight glow right up on the bottom of this pot. Mix up a light gray or maybe just white and put the lip of that pot right in here. I'm really loading up this brush with the white paint and I'm laying this on there quite thick. Now I think I can put in this handle. So it's going to go over here and land about here. It's going to disappear some in this area. So you just have to kind of have to commit, bring it around and in back of her hand and then it just sort of disappears in that steam. Let's go up now and work more on this background. I'm going to mix up some more green and let's put a few little nondescript strokes up here that are reminiscent of some palm fronds and give this a real southern Florida look. I'm taking some uh, ultramarine blue and white. I'm going to add a few little negative areas back here that might be reminiscent of some sky. I could take a larger brush like this and just with a very light touch soften those even more. This is just being done with a very light touch. 
softening that. I'm hardly getting any paint on these bristles. Now this edge right here is very harsh. It's a very hard line. So I don't, don't like that. I think one way to soften that edge is by lightening some of this skirt to bring them more towards the value of this. So lighten that, bring those right in there. I think right up here I need to make this darker, a few more dark passages just to bring that contrast up. And since those are palmettos, I'm going to mix a lighter color, sort of a yellow ochreish color. And with that light touch, even with a large brush, I can make some pretty fine lines. Now right down here, this part of her apron just seems a bit too bright to me. It just seems to be hogging a lot of the attention. So I'm going to cut that back some and not have that quite as bright. Yeah, I think even just that little bit there brings the focus up into this area better. And to finish the painting, I think I'm going to just refine a few of these shadows in the foreground. Maybe make them a very warm, burnt sienna, yellow ochreish mix. Well, I've tried to keep this painting fairly loose, so I don't want to go into too much more detail, but I really enjoyed capturing this moment in time of Emma cooking at the historic Fort Mose. So I'll sign this painting now and bring it to completion. For more information about painting and travel with Roger and Sarah Bansimer, visit paintingandtravel.com.